tenara tātou katoa i te tuatahi māku miha te kito tātou kaihangi i runga rawa nāna te timatanga me te whakamutu ngā ngā mea katoa he honore kororia ki aia. Tēne wai huriana ngā mihi ki a kōrua ko a whakatau mai ki a mātou tēnā kōrua he te whaia tēne te miha te kia koe mo tō karanga mai ki a mātou ko a kaua e mātou ai ngā pukenga me te aroha me te whakapono mō tēnei kaupapa nui mō o tātou tamariki mokupuna ngā tānga takātoa. Nō reira e te whaia tēnei te miha tu ki a koe no hoki e hoa mō tō mihi mai tō kōrero, pūkōrero ki a mātou i tēnei wā. Nō reira ki a kōrua koutou te haukainga a tēnā koutou. I tēnei wā, huriana ngā mihi ki a tātou katoa ki a kōrua Ena, kōrua ko Cameron. Ai, he hai kua tai mai ahau i tēne wā, nā kōrua meto o kōrua, tā kōrua kōtiro. Nā, 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 nā koutou te kaha, ka whakapau kaha mō tēnei kaupapa, nō reira ngā mihi nui kia, mihi rangatira kia kōrua. O ti rā kia tātou katoa, mai ngā koko ngā whā te motu, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia rama tātou katoa. Kia ora, John. Thank you for the invitation to come here today. Thank you for the opportunity, Cameron and Anna, to be a part of the co-papa that we're here to talk about and promote and support. And thank you to you all for here coming together to launch, I believe, the inaugural national respiratory strategy to come to Hui and Wananga on an important issue of respiratory health and well-being for New Zealanders and I have a particular interest like many of you probably do around our next generation of New Zealanders and uh, those being the tamariki mokopuna. So I, uh, I'm going to just, yeah, I've, I've got a bit of a background to my quarter. I'm going I'm to kick off and I want to start by, uh, I was reflect, looking through the National Respiratory Strategy, just very quickly, which was launched yesterday, and it's fantastic. I had a um, quick look at the news, um, the media release on the New Zealand Herald yesterday. But what really struck me with this, the hard copy, is these images of these healthy children that are, you know, just planted throughout the, the, the this resource. I, I have done a fair bit of public speaking and I often would start off with a picture of my son and I. So he's our youngest son, his name's Lance, and we have seven children, my wife and I, and I was sharing with Cameron and Anna, the, uh, you have to have six, six children, you run out of unique names, so the poor guy got lumbered with Lance. <laughs> so we have all these tūpuna names that have got deep, meaningful um, background behind them and, uh, and then just Lance Jr. So. But I... Um, Similar to what's in this book, you know, I, I use this image to talk about a Kodak moment that every parent, every, every father, every son should enjoy in New Zealand, which is that opportunity to look into your, your child's eyes and know that they're full of potential hope and greatness. And for that child to look into your eyes and see that you will provide them with leadership and protection and guidance and... Um, that's that Kodak moment that I think, you know, is reflected in this resource, you know, that we should be aiming and aspiring for, for all children and all parents, all fathers, sons, mothers, daughters in, uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I guess, you know, that was a, a lead-in to the fact that we don't get that Kodak moment in every household, in every community, in every family in New Zealand. And that has to change. And, um, you know, I... Uh, you know, I guess in my job as a GP, I work in, you know, rural, remote New Zealand, is about trying to do my best to make sure that the images that we're reading in this book, and, and I know that many of you are the, are the same um, aspirations, are, are realised, you know. So, um, and I guess, you know, this, this photo has taken a real massive turn for me recently because... Um, you know, I know what you know. It is to live with a, a child now is a chronic disease, and a debil debilitating disease. And you know, like it was really—I'll be honest—it was really hard to make a decision to come here today, 
because of the struggles that I'm having personally with dealing with a son who's just been diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which has significant um, uh, complications, and one of them being respiratory. You know, last night I was sleeping with my son next to him, and I could hear him, you know, having symptoms, I think, of suggestive of obstructive sleep apnea because of, you know, the fact that he's on steroids and he's getting cushionoid and swollen and, and a whole lot of other things that could be going on. So, you know, I never knew 12, 24 months ago when I was using this image that I'd be talking more from the heart when I talk about, um, you know, um, trying to address, you know, you know, especially preventable chronic disease, you know, and uh, that's what I'm wanting to talk about today. So it was hard to make a decision to come down here today because, like I say, there's so many other things going on in my life. And, and, if, and shortly, you know, I take off after this talk to go and meet with your colleagues and my colleague, you know, Innes Asher this afternoon to have a respiratory assessment for our son at Starship and cardiology assessment tomorrow. I came here, though, for a couple of reasons. Number one, and I've mentioned Anna and, and Cameron, is, um, is because of this amazing, inspirational young wahine Māori that I met at a playground in Whangarei. Um, just, you know, because she just happened to be a really outgoing and sort of convincing and, you know, um, a young woman who uh, inspired me about um, this important cope up of bronchitis. And importantly, I am here because, you know, I've got some stories to share with you to say there's really important things within your, this na our national respiratory strategy that we have to we have to really tackle, you know, because the stories I'm going to share with you are really compelling, another compelling reason for me to be down here today, despite the fact that it was, like, challenging. So, I, just to anong a mihi kia kōrua, tō kōtero nei, just to say, you know, it was, um, yeah, it must have been about 18 months ago that we actually met in that, that playground, Cameron, with Esther, uh, the background to that was I had a little column in a, in a local paper and I talked about local health issues and, and we talked about, I, I wrote an article about bronchiectasis and, and Esther contacted me and said, oh, I really want to meet with you to talk about a bit further about um, what are my aspirations and dreams and moi moia for um, forming a, the Bronchiectasis Foundation, which um, there's members of that um, team here today and Kaz and others just to acknowledge, um, you know, we were there, this, the launch in Whangarei on the 7th of April this year, um, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, te o haki o te, o te kōtero nei. So uh, I wanted to, the, the platform for respiratory health and the addressing respiratory disease that I wanted to take off from was um, bronchiectasis. So... You know, the I, I, I'm I'm going to assume there's going to be people in the audience that know a little bit about um, bronchitis, and there's going to be some that know a lot. So be with me. But I guess you know the the issue for me and for many of you is that bronchitis is you know the rheumatic fever of the lungs. You know, it's it's preventable. It af it afflicts children, and it's well. When I say preventable, there's parts of, you know, there's some of the um, children have obviously congenital causes for it, but, you know, the, the really important issue that I'm trying to uh, tackle both in my practice and why I'm here today is the ones, the things that we can change. I can't change the fact that my son has to share muscular dystrophy, but we can definitely change the fact that children live in cold homes and aren't getting access to good quality primary care. Now, so when I say that, you know, it's the rheumatic fever of the lungs, um, rheumatic fever has high profile. And, you know, that's unfortunately or fortunately the consequence of political will and political champions. And, you know, we need to uh, really consider, you know, you know, where things get prioritised. But, you know, bronchitis is a significant issue because, like I said, it's... You know that some of the drivers for the preventable um, uh, types of bronchitis and causes are, are the things that are in the strategy. It's cold homes, it's damp homes, it's overcrowding, and um, and, and you know like it's you know just like rheumatic fever, it's you know like a sore throat, 
you get an attack of rheumatic, acute rheumatic fever, you get another sore throat, six months later you get another attack of rheumatic fever and it's just a cumulative damage that occurs to the, to the heart and the lungs are exactly the same. I've just got a story here to kick off with, which was actually two. So I was saying to Kaz on the way in, I've, I have a practice in Kaitaia, which is a general practice, and you know we opened up our practice to you know this this promise, I guess, and this commitment to offer accessible care to high needs communities. And so 95% of our patients are Maori in in, in Kaitaia. We have 3,000 patients, which is not a big practice by some people's standards, but it's incredibly busy. Um, and we, you know, we just you know, whilst it's really difficult given uh, to, to continue with all my clinical work, and I'll say in the case, it's really important because it gives me the opportunity to be at the coalface and be in the trenches to see what the problems are. And, and that's in a good way and a bad way, I guess. You know, sometimes it's encouraging because we see the incredible resilience of communities that are under the pump and that are so challenged. And, and despite the fact that they're underserved, they do incredibly well. You know, the parents that um, are often maligned and said, you know, don't, you know, the, don't do a good job, um, actually do an incredible job. And uh, so I just, this is a couple of cases that are my practice, from my practice. And, you know, this is an 11 year old boy who, Unfortunately, two or three years ago, he got diagnosed with bronchiectasis, and he he came in. He's probably the sickest child I've ever seen. He didn't die, and um, he was in a wheelchair, and his head was flopped back, and he came into our practice, and he'd been unwell for a, a good three or four days or a week, um, and his family live in in Northland. And you wouldn't believe it, there was a tornado that came through Northland about 12 months ago. And the only house in North, you know, in this area that had its roof ripped off was this house where this boy lives. Um, and anyway, he came in and it was just not a, not a brainer that, you know, he needed to be um, sent to hospital. And, he, and he, he gets a helicopter, a free ride in a helicopter from Kaita Hospital when he's just sick. You know, he's hypertensive, tachycardic, he's febrile. Um, I think he may have had some renal impairment as well, but he was really crook. He had 10 days in intensive care. He had a total of three weeks in hospital. And, you know, this is already for a burdened family, okay? These are not families like myself and probably many of us that could manage perhaps this once-in-a-lifetime catastrophic event where we, you know, have to negotiate with our employers or, you know, find someone to cover our bills while we spend three weeks in hospital and negotiate with our supportive whānau to look after our other th six kids, in my case. Um, and these are families that are struggling along on you know, minimal income, um, have other social issues. If you look at Stats New Zealand, Census New Zealand, they define what a high-risk family is. It's, you know, it's like, it's welfare dependency, it's um, unemployment, it's health issues, it's mental health issues, it's housing issues. Um, and, you know, like, you can throw a blanket over these people and say these are high-risk people that are, you know, if we're going to struggle, they're going to struggle, you know, ten times, tenfold. And so the burden is, you know, like, you know, there's this psychological burden of them having to travel to Whangarei, which is three hours away. So, you know, being away from the other children, that impacts on their learning and their opportunities. Um, there are impacts on their relationship because, you know, mum has to be down there, dad has to be up here. And even, you know, some of them, this is probably, you know, admission number six, and they were saying, oh, we, we won't be able to go. So the 11-year-old the spends time in ICU on his own, you know. And um, so there's that cost to the family, and it's more than just like a, a financial cost. There's a, a psychological cost, there's a social cost, and... Um, yeah, there's a cost, I guess, in terms of the wairua, you know, a spiritual cost. Um, then there's the cost to our country, you know, the cost of 10 days in intensive care and helicopter rides and paramedics and specialists and, and then the damage to the lungs that we know if it was rheumatic heart disease will mean they'll have, you know, cardiac surgery or they'll be well, sickness beneficiaries at the age of 30 or they'll be on, you know, medication to support failing lungs or hearts and or they die prematurely. 
and then that's that whole spiral of family, the children that they may have, and the the inability to be an effective parent to that um, those children, and, and an effective partner, and, and an effective member of our community, our marae, our our wider whanau. So that's just you know this sentinel event, and I get the sentinel event. I guess is actually you know perhaps a preventable um, event uh, event that occurred. 10 years ago, you know, this, or in this case, say, six years ago or something. Um, or it could be the fact that someone, you know, they weren't getting into quality housing or getting support to have, um, you know, insulation or whatever it is, or support to have smoking cessation in their family and stuff like that. So the, the other case is, you know, this, and I'll talk about this a bit more after, um, but is the six-year-old who's got recurrent chest infections with every month you could set your watch by this event, you know, and um, and they would have fevers, cough and vomiting, and the, and the grandmother would say you'd never have a clear chest. So people in the room will know why grandparents look after grandchildren in our communities, okay? It's not generally by choice. These are generally vulnerable children that are some, most often under the care of the state. Um, there's one school in Kaitai that has a third of their family uh, children are raised by two parent families, a third are raised by single parent families, and a third are raised by grandparents. And so that's a, that's a reflection of not unfortunately our tikanga or our culture. It's uh, not a matter of choice, it's usually a matter of necessity that these children are living with their grandparents. But this particular case, this, this grandmother um, said, there's something wrong with his lungs. And I'll, I'll hope, I think I've, I'll talk more about this child soon. I'm gonna just, you know, like the National Respiratory Strategy, um, one of the priority areas is the environment. So it's, you know, the story to this is, um, I was at the, the background to this is I was at the Mitre 10 in Kaitaia and a lady came up to me in the car park and said, <clears throat> look, I have, I have health problems with my, um, and I think it's due to my house. Uh, I have seven kids and we've had 10 strep throats in the last six months. They have a child who has rheumatic fever or rheumatic heart disease and gets monthly penicillin injections by a public health nurse. Uh, she has, um, you know, this, you know, in terms of those Census New Zealand um, criteria for high risk families, and you know, they probably I think you have to have six to be high risk out of fourteen, and she has like ten. Um, and she lives in a housing New Zealand home, and a, and uh, and she said, look, could you could you do something? And I was, she's not my patient, but you know. <laughs> and I step on someone else's toes when I go into their boundaries, you know about that? <laughs> and um, so, you know, I happened to have someone contact me because they said, oh, we've heard about what you're doing and we'd like to come up and try and help out. I said, well, look, I've got this lady fortuitously who just called me yesterday and they need some help. So we, so these guys come from Auckland, you know, um, on their white horse and, uh, and they come up and we went out to this place and, you know, she knew exactly what the problems were with the health of their family, and you know, it was clear. You know, we failed. We failed this family, mm -hmm. and we failed this family at our own peril, as a country and as a um, as a community, and as a sector. You know, health sector. You know, it's just we have um, we have this situation here where the, she said, "Look, the the house is leaking and mouldy, and." What's really stark here with this case is, can you, so there's three bedroom housing New Zealand home, right? And it's about 15 years old. And this is one of the rooms, but what's really obvious about this room? Not, not this, these photos here, mould, because this is all mould, but what's, can you see what's, there's no furniture, because they don't live in it. So it's a three bedroom home, and they, two rooms that don't use, because it's damp and mouldy. And the mould, you know, I could touch this jib board and, and it's all soft. And um, this is a housing New Zealand home that gets an annual inspection. And this is a house that houses seven high needs children as well as a mother. One has rheumatic heart disease, 
One's engaged on a monthly basis with, a public, with our public health system getting penicillin injections. But if you go in and do this, I'm here to do, give a needle, and you don't look at everything else, and I've seen this time and time again, you, you're, we contribute to being a part of the problem rather than being a part of the solution. And so this was one room, and they have an amazing amount of storage area. And that's criminal, because they all live in the lounge. And in a house that shouldn't be overcrowded, they all sleep on the same mattress in the lounge. So that was, you know, that's a problem. But, you know, like, I wanted to show you this. I, this shows that despite our failings as a, as a society and as a, you know, and I, I pass this information on to Paula Bennett and others, you know, to say, look, these, these are issues that need to be addressed, um, you know, and to our DHB. You know, this to me is a sign of resilience, you know. This is like a manuka um, staked out uh, vegetable garden. And whilst everyone might say this is a, you know, another classic example of a family not helping themselves, you know, this may, this does get said, um, you know, this is actually a sign of their resilience. You know, she, mum has the best intentions. The fact that she'll approach me in the Māori Ten car park and say, can you come out and have a look? Um, and, you know, so these, and they're really, really important people, you know, and I believe that, I believe that in our most vulnerable sections of New Zealand, we have the most uh, valuable un polished diamonds that we, you know, invest a little bit in across the whole lot, we'll get some incredible return on. So not only will we save costs, we will have incredible productivity, incredible contribution to our country if we just give them a chance. Um, John, how long have I got? Five minutes? Gosh, I always get, I talk too long. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll rattle on through. And, um, so we talk, you know, your strategy, and all the key things I want to talk about was the environment. So I already know this is really important, right? So the environment's critical, and, you know, retrofit insulation's great, but we, you know, we have housing stocks that we do a really bad job of caring for, and the most vulnerable people go into it. You know, that, we need to do something about that. Why? Because that's going to cost us money, and it's going to cost us money in terms of health costs, welfare costs in the future, and productivity costs, you know, taxpayers that um, taxpayers. The health system... I want to point out too. So this is the case I wanted to talk to you about, six-year-old. Now, they, they gave me permission. It was like, this is the grandmother, and this is little Isaiah who came to me uh, three months ago. And the grandmother said, I'm coming because no one's listening to me. I'm coming because for 12 months that I've had this child, I take them to the doctor every month, and I say he's got a chesty cough that never clears. He's always has one month where he's having fevers, vomiting, and he has to have five days off. You know, Kaz and I were talking about the fact that, man, I wish we were better at looking at attendance records for schools, and we could say, hey, alarm, 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 someone's taking 60, you know, or 20, 30, 40 days off a year when only the average is five, six days. Um, let's send a health team in or let's do something, you know, to assess the health of this child and this family. So this mother, you know, a grandmother, took this child every month and got all sorts of treatments, allergic rhinitis, asthma, got all these other things. But, you know, then they came to see me and she said, I'm here because no one's listening to me. And that is more important than any vital sign. That is more important than a blood pressure, than a heart rate, than an oxygen level, than a temperature, because they're saying, some, no one's listening to me. And um, I, there's something wrong with this boy's lungs. And I was like, you, you don't say. You know, like I, so we got a chest X-ray, and this child, um, you know, we did all the bits and pieces, and he got, went down to Whangarei Hospital, had a high-resolution CT scan, which confirmed he had bronchiectasis. But, you know, this is the, the crying shame for me and for all of us is this was, could have been diagnosed 12 months ago or 24 months ago or 36 months ago. Instead of having more pronounced and marked bronchiectasis and scarring of his lungs, he could have had, you know, we could have addressed it or maybe stopped the massive and severe acute bronchiolitis that he got when he was six months of age because he lived in a cold, smoky home. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, yeah, I mean, this, you know, the grandmother brings him back now and, you know, after his, you know, his treatment regime that he got in hospital and she goes, oh, he's, he's got so much more energy and, you know, it's really amazing to know, you know, see the smile on this kid's face, but it's really sorry to see that we have this happening. And that, 
the, the reason I came down, as well as supporting Esther's Moi Moya, who dreamed to see the Bronx Exodus Foundation be an important part of the New Zealand spiritual landscape, was that this was one of six children in the last six months that we have diagnosed with Bronx Exodus. So um, there's a six month old, there's a 10 month old, there's this boy, there's another uh, 10 year old. And the stories are the same. Like of the six, the 10 month old had chest, uh, sorry, the 10 year old had chest x-rays, and I only, I, I didn't believe he had bronchitis, uh, I, I suspect he had pneumonia. So I did a chest x-ray and had a really good going right middle lobe pneumonia. But you know, when I look back on the x-rays he'd had over his years, <clears throat> he'd had four x-rays, like when he was 10 months of age. One minute? Okay. Um, you know, uh, three years of age, five years, and then my one and they all showed the same problem in the same place, but no one had connected. No one had looked, I only, look, only found out about it because I thought, I didn't think he had a pneumonia when I examined him, so I was really interested to know what I'd missed. And then I saw that he'd had, hey, there's one in 2005 and 2000, and, you know, and, um, but no one had looked at the fact that this high-risk child, Māori child who's 10 years of age with recurrent chest infections, had several serial X-rays showing the problem, there's something going on in his, in his middle lobe. We had um, the respiratory, paediatric respiratory physician, um, Heaven? Heaven, yeah, come up, he was holidaying, and I happened to pull him into my clinic and show him the x-ray, and he said, yeah, unfortunately we had that, right. So, look, I, just really quickly, these, these are the most inequitable diseases in New Zealand for Māori, so I have a passion about Māori health and a passion about children's health, in particular for Māori. The most disparate health um, uh, death rate and the most disparate disease is chronic rheumatic heart disease. 7.46 times greater risk of dying if you're Māori than non Māori. And it's worse for our Pacifica whānau. The next one is type 2 diabetes complication. And the next one after that is bronchiectasis. Now, this is 10 years old, but I, I don't think things have changed a heap in the last 10 years. But um, those, the top two of the top three disparate health conditions for Māori afflict, afflict children, okay? And they're in, in many cases preventable. I'm not going to go on too much other than say we have, in our three, population of 3,000, we have about equal numbers of repeat kids, and this is not kids only, but adults with rheumatic heart disease and adults and children with chronic, uh, sorry, bronchiectasis. And so we'll see a six-month-old, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 22-year-old, a 40-year-old, and a 60-year-old, all with bronchiectasis. So it shows that it's not going away. Okay, that's a compelling point there. Um, I'm not going to, you know about this, it's about poverty-related disease, and that's all preventable. So anyway, I just like to say, look, it's, it is, um, whilst it's a real challenge to get down here, I'm really, really proud and humbled to be able to represent the Bronchiectasis Foundation and our, 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 our wahine, our wahine toa, uh, and to support this kaupapa and um, sh share some stories with what I see is important, I'm sure you all do, around the health and well-being of New Zealanders, in particular our respiratory health. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tāta katoa. Notice from the office about two months ago that I asked to thank you for your presentation this morning. I was I was wrapped because in July I was given your book, The Good Doctor, and um, and I was wrapped because my family, the boy said, Dad, you'll enjoy this because this is an outstanding guy. I had one problem. Yep. My wife took it. <laughs> and she read it. And yep. do you know something what happened? I said, well, I'm thanking this guy. So I said, well, you're going to have to write a book review. <laughs> <laughs> there it is there. You've covered a lot. But Lance, you as a, as, as, a, as a person, your life's gone from zero to hero. You reflect in your book about your childhood, about your parents and the troubles. You know, moving, being moved out of schools. You know, suspension, expelled. It was an open book about your life, but what turned your life around, mm. and the inspiration of going to that boarding school, and the fact that you saw role models, and that you, you were inspired, mm. 
And the credit to you, Lance, of you're now turning that around and doing it for others. And you are making a huge difference in our community, not only up north, but also within New Zealand, because you are a true leader. You are a giver. And you've been recognised for all these leadership awards, Kiwi Bank, New Zealand of Years, so Peter Blake. But it's a credit to you as a father and as a human being and as a married GP, you're making a difference with your focus. So my friend, I want to thank you so much for your sharing your thoughts and your advice today. I just want to give you one bit of advice, if I can. Yep. When you write the ne next book, I want you to call it The Great Doctor, <laughs> not The Good Doctor, because you are a great doctor. And we just want to wish you many blessings this afternoon and tomorrow as you work with your clinical assessments with your son, and we'll be thinking of you. So thank you. Let's put our hands together. Te whakapono me.